Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are very grateful to have you all with us for National Organ and Tissue Donation Awareness Week, or NOTDA, which is the easier way to say it. I have an incredible guest host with me today, Janine Johnson. Thank you so much for co-hosting this with us. Of course, I would not want to be anywhere else other than here today. <laughs> awesome. So I'm going to start with a land acknowledgement, and then we'll discuss a little bit about what NOTDA is, and uh, we'll get going. So today, I would like to acknowledge the sacred land that we are meeting on at UHN, the Center for Living Organ Donation. It's on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaties signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. This territory is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee allied nations to peacefully share and care for the lands around the Great Lakes. We recognize and deeply appreciate the history and connection to these lands and the enduring presence, knowledge, and philosophies of Indigenous people living here today. We acknowledge the continuing accomplishments and contributions Indigenous people make in shaping and strengthening this community. We have a responsibility as beneficiaries to commit to acknowledging and understanding the history and the current experience of First Nations, Inuit and Métis people, and for the understanding to inform the work that we do at UHN and the Centre for Living Organ Donation, so that first we can stop perpetuating the damages of colonization and second to begin to repair them. Land acknowledgements are just one very small step in doing this work. We're grateful for the opportunity to meet here and reaffirm our commitment to making the promise and challenge of truth and reconciliation real in our communities and to co-create, collaborate, respectful paths together. So thank you so much. And now to discuss NOTDA, we're going to have an, an open discussion here tonight with some wonderful guests. As I said, NOTA is National Organ and Tissue Donation Awareness Week. We celebrate it at the same time every year during Be a Donor Month, which is April. We know that there are many triumphs and tribulations that come along with a diagnosis, <clears throat> during treatment, with a transplant. And so this week, we really want to celebrate living donors, recipients, caregivers, and honor and hold grief and gratitude in our hearts for donor families. We are so grateful for those who take that step in some of the hardest moments of their lives. My name is Candace. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator for the Center for Living Organ Donation. And I'm also a kidney transplant recipient myself. So back in 2008, when I was 24 years old, I thought that I just had a really bad flu and I got blood work done, and it turned out that I was actually in end-stage renal failure without that knowledge. I was under 5% kidney function, and I started dialysis within 24 hours of, of my diagnosis. I stayed as an inpatient um, for three weeks, doing hemodialysis every day to get stronger. And during that time, I learned about all of the different pathways that I could take, and I really did not want to be in center. So I learned a lot about peritoneal dialysis. And after about five months on hemodialysis, I transferred to peritoneal. And I did that for about 10 months. All throughout that process, my mom was being worked up to be my living donor. And we were extremely lucky and extremely grateful that on September 9th of 2009, my mom became my kidney donor. And I have not done a single day of dialysis since then. Um, I've been able to graduate university, buy a home. I have married my incredible partner. And we now have a beautiful, spunky, silly two-year-old daughter at home as well. So organ donation has done amazing things for my life and the community that I'm part of. And so I'm just really happy to have this conversation and, and to continue working with people who are waiting for transplants, who have been through the process, caregivers, and the entire team that's behind us. So thank you for joining us tonight. And I wanna pass it over to my amazing co-host Janine to tell us a little bit about herself too. Thank you, Candice. So my name is Janine. I am also a kidney transplant recipient. 
Back in my 20s, I was diagnosed with lupus. And with that, they explained to me that I will eventually have to get a kidney transplant because the lupus, it's an autoimmune disease that literally just ravages your insides in terms of taking your immune system and turning against it and fights everything. And unfortunately, my kidney was one of the organs that was damaged. So my doctor told me eventually I will need to get a kidney transplant. That faithful day came March 27, 2018. And I literally, when I heard that I needed a transplant, myself, my family members, my mom, everybody went to overdrive. We started putting out ads. We started reaching out through Facebook, sharing my story. And faithfully, someone saw this ad. Her name is Christy. And she happened to be going to the same church as my cousin. And she saw the ad off of my cousin's page. And she said, you know what? I want to see if I could become a donor. And one thing led to another. She went ahead. She got tested. And fortunately, I was blessed enough to receive Christy's kidney. And so I am here today enjoying, you know, motherhood and going ahead and prepping my daughter for prom coming up next month and just enjoying life to the fullest because we received, we, meaning myself, my family, friends, we all receive a second chance at life because this doesn't only affect just me, but it affects my family and friends as well. So someone took the time to donate and here I am today sharing my story with you. So that is my story. So today we're focusing our webinar on grief and gratitude. We have two people with firsthand experiences joining us tonight to discuss their journey with these two emotions that often come hand in hand with organ donation, grief and gratitude. We also have a nurse manager who is the person that, the person that makes that very important call. This webinar is a joint initiative with the Center for Living Organ Donation and ACB Organ Health YouTube channel. With that, I'd love to get this started. So our first video this evening is all about how to register your consent. This was produced by Chris Smith, who is part of our ACB Organ Health YouTube committee. He's going to walk us through how to register your consent to be an organ donor once you've passed. Help us fill in the blanks. Take two minutes out of your day that could change someone's life forever. So you've made up your mind, you want to be a donor. So let's head on over to beadonor.ca and let's get you registered. Did you know that 1,600 Ontarians are currently awaiting an organ transplant? 90% of people agree with organ transplant, but only 35% of those are registered. So let's get you registered. Now if you have frequently asked questions, questions like what organs can I donate? You can find those answers here. And if you've got more questions, click more frequently asked questions. Once you're done, head down and hit register. This will take you to the Service Ontario Online Organ and Tissue Donation Registration Portal. From here, you're going to register, check, or update the status of your organ donation. Don't forget your health card. You're going to have to select what type of health card you have whether you have the red and white one or a photo health card. Me, I've got a photo health card. Then you're gonna enter your health card number here. We'll have to determine what kind of series health card you have. You can find the version code with these pictures. Then select your birth date. Now, once you've got the three check marks, you're ready to go from here. You'll have to consent to save lives. Would you like to donate organs and tissues for transplant only or for medical research? If you want to donate all organs and tissues, click the first box. You can also decide to only donate some organs and tissues. If you want to opt out to donating some organs and tissues, click below. Let's review. We're almost there. Now you're going to give your consent. If you're satisfied with the information, then we're ready to proceed. From here, you're going to scroll down, check the consent box, then you're going to submit. Remember, you can change your mind at any time and update the information. By making the choice, we could all one day save up to eight lives, maybe even the life of someone you love. 
And just like that, you're registered your consent to be an organ donor. Love that video. So upbeat and everything is just easy. It just shows yeah. how, how easy it is. Yes. And I think that that's such a great thing that Chris really brings forward is it's so easy to do and it's mm-hmm. so straightforward and anyone can do it within such a short amount of time if you have your health card. So we wanted to open up tonight with with that short video to show you how easy it is to register your consent if you haven't already. And we've got some great guests tonight who are going to talk about organ donation. They're going to talk about their journey. And also at the end of tonight, we can have some really interactive Q&A as well. So let's get started in asking Arlene to join us. Arlene is a Métis citizen from Treaty 1 Territory and homeland of Red River Métis in Winnipeg, Manitoba. She joined the CanSolve CKD network to connect with fellow families affected by chronic kidney disease and share her experiences as a caregiver to her late husband, Glenn. She's been involved as a patient partner with CanSolve CKD network since 2018. Arlene has become a strong voice in the network through her engagement with numerous projects and committees such as co-chair of the Indigenous Peoples Engagement Research Council, or IPERC, member of the Patient Governance Circle, PGC, Canadian Nephrology Trials Network, CNTN, executive and the Storytelling for Impact Group. She's passionate about amplifying patient voices and sharing moments in care that she has experienced, which aims to enhance the kidney care that individuals and families receive. Amazing, Arlene. Wow. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Yes. It's always such a pleasure to have you in my space and get to hear your story and get to hear you so passionately. So thank you so much. I'm incredibly humbled to have even been asked to come and speak. My journey with kidney disease started with my husband, Glenn, back in, well, he initially was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. So I was a caregiver to my late husband, Glenn, who passed away from kidney disease in February 2016. But our journey with CKD and diabetes was a very long one, which started probably in the late 1990s. It started with type 2 diabetes, late onset for him. It was, he was in his mid 30s, I guess, when it started. And when he was diagnosed, he didn't take it seriously enough. It was kind of like, yeah, I was told I have type two diabetes. It was really nothing. He really didn't make an effort to take care of it. He just thought it would go away. Like he lived in denial when it came to his health. So, I mean, throughout the nineties, his sugars were all over the place. They were way too high. Every doctor's appointment always consisted of being told that he had protein seeping into his urine and things just getting worse and worse and worse. And it got to the point where the diabetes doctor said, you know what, I, we need to have you go to a nephrologist. I can't manage this because we know that your kidneys are sick, but I can't tell you for sure how sick they are. So based on his numbers, they were pretty sure that he had kidney disease. So we went off to see the the nephrologist in, I think it was 1999 when we were introduced to him. And I remember very, very clearly remember the first appointment, a very nice fellow. He was very calm and Glenn was very, we were both very blasé about the whole thing. And I remember him sitting down across from us and telling us, well, Glenn, you were at 59% functioning. You know, given what I know now, about kidney disease and what we didn't know back then, that should have been like an atomic bomb being dropped on us. It should have been similar to getting a cancer diagnosis. Had he been given a cancer diagnosis, I can tell you, he would have did everything he possibly could to battle for his life. But because we didn't know, it was kind of like, okay, 59%. That really didn't mean a whole lot. It didn't mean nothing. It meant nothing to us. It was like, kind of like, okay, And he continued on his journey all the way up until 2010, where everything absolutely 100% changed. His appointments consisted of being monitored. And up until that point, I really was sporadic with going with him to his appointments. I mean, it was kind of like you didn't know what you didn't know until that last appointment. I was at work and he typically would call me after a nephrology appointment. And this time he didn't. 
So I thought, oh, that's a little interesting. What's going on? So I called him and said, okay, well, how come you haven't called me? It's been a couple hours since you've been there. Like, well, what's going on? And he said, well, it's really not good news. And I said, well, what do you mean it's not good news? And he said, well, he told me that I'm no longer going to be monitored by him. I'm going to be switched over now to the renal clinic at the other hospital. And uh, we're going to be doing full-on dialysis uh, transplant planning. And I remember just thinking, what are you talking about? Like, what have you not told me all this time? So he was at home. I said, well, you better come and get me because I'm at work. So he came to get me and it was a very interesting ride home. And I just said to him, like, what the heck happened? Like, what have you not been telling me? And he said, well, I just sort of thought, and, well, I guess I thought wrong. And I just remember looking at him and just saying, you know what? This is my life too. You're playing with my life now. You've kept this from me, but, you know, I can't believe this. I'm so mad at you. Like, why could, why would you keep this from me? And he's like, well, I didn't know. And so it got a little quiet for a couple of minutes. And I just remember turning to him and saying, you know what? Just so you're, you're understanding, I'm clear. I'm here for the long haul. It doesn't matter what happens. This is about me and you, and we're going to get through this together. Every appointment from now on, we're going to go to together. And whatever you need, we're going to get you. Like, I'm here for the long haul because this is our life. And we did. Right from that point on, we went to the nephrology clinic. And I remember walking in there and thinking, wow, this is different. You know, I remember meeting his nephrologist there, Claudio Rigato. If anybody's ever had the pleasure of meeting Claudio, just know what you see is absolutely what you get with him. He's an amazing doctor. But I remember my first impression of him coming in and he was just like this big ray of sunshine. Here we were all hopeless thinking, oh my God, Glenn's going to die at any given point in time. We felt like we had to live our whole life in a matter of minutes, seconds, because we didn't know what we didn't know. And Claudio comes blowing in, asks Glenn a bunch of questions and then says, Glenn, we're going to make you feel better. We're going to get you on the way. And he's just, just perky and just happy. And I'm thinking, and the whole time I'm looking at Glenn and he's looking at me with a face that says, don't say anything. Don't say anything, Arlene. Just keep your mouth shut. Claudio leaves the room. And I remember looking at Glenn and saying, well, what the heck was that? And he's like, I don't know. I don't know. Claudio comes back in. He's exactly the same way again. He says, okay, well, we need to decide what modality you're going to go with. And, you know, this is, we're going to give you some options, but we're not going to tell you what they are today. We're going to, you're going to come back. You know, I know it's a lot of information. So he said, we're going to decide this is between PD, explain what PD dialysis was, home hemo was, and home hemo was still relatively new at that point in 2010. It was making some, ch like people were doing it, but there was changes happening with the machines and whatnot. And he says, home hemo, we'll kind of put that away for a little while. But you should really maybe think about PD and, and, and okay, he says, I really don't want to see you do a home hemo. You're a young guy. You know, you should be doing what you're doing, working and not coming to in-center dialysis three times a week. So we literally left that appointment with all of the information, talked about it, saying, okay, well, maybe we'll do PD. PD sounds the most practical for us to do. So we had a follow-up appointment to go like a week and a half later to say, okay, well, this is what we decided. Well, from the appointment we had, the Glenn starting dialysis was literally a week. He literally had what they call an acute start where he was crashing at home. Like he was so fluid overloaded that I remember watching him and thinking, oh my God, you're not going to make it. You're going to die. You're going to die tonight here at home. I can't deal with this. And I begged him to go to the hospital and he kept saying, no, I'm not going. No, I'm not going. I'll go to the clinic in the, in the morning at 8 a.m. We got through the night. I called the clinic, explained everything that was going on. And the nurse said, okay, I'll call you right back. She called me back five minutes later and she said, please get him here as soon as you can. We're taking him in and we're going to have a procedure done where he's going to have a catheter put in and he's going to be on his first round of dialysis this morning by 11 o'clock. But don't tell him that. Just get him here. So I said to him, okay, well, they want to see you. And he said, okay, well, let's go. It literally took me 15 minutes to get him from the house to the car. And then another five minute drive to the hospital because we literally live five minutes away. And they came out and they took him, they came and got him, got him in a wheelchair, brought him inside, laid him down on the bed, came in and said, okay, well, Glenn, we're now going to take you to the procedure room. You need to start dialysis this morning. 
And he was so, he, at that point, he just, he didn't know what was happening. He just agreed to whatever they asked him to do. And I remember being asked by the nef another nephrologist, Sean Armstrong, he said, well, would you like to come in while we insert the catheter? I remember at the time thinking, are you crazy? I almost watched him die last night. Now you want me to go into the procedure room and watch you kill him? No, I'm okay. I'm not going to watch that. Anyway, Glenn came out and they literally did hook him up to his first treatment of dialysis. I remember sitting in the unit and I cried through the whole thing. I remember thinking, he's going to die. Like, there's no way he's going to be okay. And the nurse, who I'll never forget, her name is Vicky, came up to me with a box of Kleenex and she stood beside me and she says, I know this looks really bad right now. And she said, I know whatever I'm going to say to you, you're not going to believe me, but I'm telling you, you'll see in three treatments, he's going to be completely different. He'll probably be the person you knew a couple of years ago. And I remember just looking up at her and she says, yeah, I know you think I'm full of crap, but she, she said, you'll see. So three days, three treatments later, they took off 27 pounds of, of fluid off of him. And he was incredibly different. He was back to being his usual perky self and, you know, incredible things were done for us. After that, there wasn't an appointment that I didn't go to. There was never anything that he needed that he, that if he needed it, that I didn't sit back and advocate for it because I was not going to watch him be taken from me because of kidney disease. I can tell you our team here in Winnipeg was exceptional. They did everything they possibly could because as a kidney patient, Everything that can go wrong, Glenn got. There isn't anything that he probably didn't experience that they say on the list of risks that he didn't have. He had peritonitis twice. He had a heart attack. He waited where he had stents put in. That led to him having uh, actually a bypass, a, a double bypass, which led to all kinds of different complications. His central line fell out three times where we had to go to the hospital. I mean, but through it all, he never lost his humor. He never was that patient that complained about anything. He always said, you know what? This is just something happening to me today. Tomorrow's a better day. Every morning we got up, we'd say, what's today? Today's a better day. Even if it was a bad day, today was always a better day. I mean, he took his kidney disease not seriously for 15 years, but the moment he found out, he completely changed. He went from being the absolute worst patient to the absolute poster child. We got everything he ever needed. We, I advocated on his behalf. I mean, our team here in Winnipeg was absolutely wonderful. I mean, I went from knowing nothing to knowing what I know now. You know, grateful for everything that ever happened to us. You know, for every little thing that they did for us, every little thing that I learned along the, the way. I mean, his ult when he passed in 2016, it was the worst day of my life. And it, but I can tell you it wasn't unexpected. It was absolutely not unexpected. I mean, he in the two a year prior to him passing, he'd probably been in the hospital five times. Every time he would go to the hospital, we would laugh and say, he'd, he'd post stuff on his Facebook saying, oh, I'm on vacation again. Come and see me. Come visit me. And I'd say, you know, maybe we should find a different venue to go on vacation. And he said, well, why would I want to go anywhere else? He says, I can go to the hospital. I can come here. He never called it the hospital. He says, I can come here get three meals a day, my every need, wish, want taken care of. He said, why would I want to go anywhere else? And it doesn't cost me anything to be here. And we would laugh, you know, and that's how he was. So when he passed, even while he was here, I always said, whatever I can do to use my voice to talk on behalf of kidney patients, I wanted to do. When he passed, they gave me about a year and a half and I had gone to an event at the hospital and his nephrologist, one of his nephrologists came up to me and asked me how I was. I said, oh, I'm great. I'm okay. Like things, life goes on. I'm not going to be like Glenn always said, you're not pity party. We're not pity party people. Pick yourself up. You do what you need to do, but you got to keep living. You don't keep living. He said, I will make sure I'll haunt you and let you know. So I said, no, I'm, I'm ready. Like, what would you like me to do? He said, well, we have this network. It's called Cancel CKD. We advocate on behalf of kidney patients. There's lots of research. We'd love to have you at these tables. So I remember going to the very first meeting and I literally had to drag myself there. I was so scared. I didn't think I had a voice. I literally hid in the back of the room. I called in sick actually to go to Vancouver. Like I was at my office with my suitcase in my car and I literally had to will myself to go. I 
you know, I, I willed myself to leave the office. I willed myself to go to the airport. I remember sitting in the airport thinking, oh my God, now I got to get on that plane. I got on the plane. I went to Vancouver. I thought, okay, I'm here now. I got to get myself to the hotel, got there. And I saw people I knew immediately. I was like, oh, phew. any fears that I had completely fell away. That was the first time since Glenn passed away when I was, I was able to walk into a room and just be real and raw. Because when you're dealing with a chronic disease, even though you're the caregiver, you, we live our own journey. We live kid, kidney, like I lived kidney disease with him. I may not have physically had it, but I lived it every single day with him. And walking into that room in Vancouver, it was like, I didn't have to put on the face I had to put for my family because people as caring as they are, they truly don't know what you're going through. But when you walk into a room with people who've gone through what you have, it's completely different and you're able to give back. So for, for me joining there to where I am today is completely different. I mean, the things I've been able to do and just using your voice at the tables with these researchers and giving presentations, you know, if you've ever been in a room with a researcher, they have great ideas. They have, they come from a pure place of where they want to make something better for the patient, but sometimes it's just not practical. It's not practical to your everyday life. So when you're sitting at the table with a, as a patient partner and you tell them your story and they hear what you have to say or you're able to contribute, it makes a huge difference. So it'll never bring my Glenn back. He'll never come back. But I can tell you in the CanSolve network, they all say that it's like he could walk through that door and they would know who he is because of what I say about him. And I always say he live large in life, he's living large in death, just in a different way now. Because my ultimate goal for us was, after his passing, is I never wanted him to be that statistic on a piece of paper that said, yeah, he didn't make it, just another one. And mm -hmm. I never want another family to lose what I lost. If I can use my voice to, to tell you my story of how we live through kidney disease and everything we ever went to, and that changes the mindset of another Glenn, and they do the work that they need to do, then it's all worth it in the end. That's my personal satisfaction out of it, knowing that he's never going to be a statistic and somebody's life is going to be changed in one shape, one way or another, by something I may or may not have said. And listening to what we went through as a family, as a couple, I mean... There's never going to be a day that I don't want him back here, of course. And I've been asked that a million times. Would you want him back here? Like, of course I'd want him back here. But I'd only want him back if he was well, because that's what he wanted. You know, mm -hmm. people don't realize. If you talk to people, you say, what's the most important organ in your body? Nine times out of ten, they'll tell you it's their heart. Well, do they realize their kidneys are just as important as their heart? They don't. Mm -hmm. Disease needs to be, when you're told you have kidney disease, it needs to be similar to a cancer diagnosis. We all know if we're told we have cancer, we hit the ground running the minute we're told. Mm -hmm. You don't know, and you're like you said, Candace, you didn't know you had it mm -hmm. until something happened. And then all of a sudden, your whole life changed in a matter of seconds. Absolutely. You know, and that's literally how we felt because he, through his diagnosis, he found out. He, he was in his mid thirties when he mm -hmm. found out that he only had one kidney. Right. Did he have only one kidney? They say it was in the shape of a horseshoe. Wow. And he was a six foot five, 250 pound guy. They said, had he been an average size man, his life expectancy probably would have been a little bit longer, but because he was as big as he was and he didn't do the work, this is what ultimately led to him passing away. For me, I'm incredibly grateful. I mean, even though he went through hell and had every kind of complication you can imagine, there wasn't a time that we didn't get what we needed or mm -hmm. that he he wasn't treated with the utmost respect. And he, he lived a, a good life. Like he did every modality of dialysis. He started mm -hmm. on hemo, he transitioned to PD, went back to hemo because of his bypass, and then he ended up doing home hemo. Of those modalities, home hemo is the one he fought the most and said, mm -hmm. I'm not doing it. But he had a nurse that was, she had so much tenacity. She she really took him on and she, she trained him. And in the end, he said, I'm incredibly grateful. So he mm -hmm. passed away at home. Like his, his goal was, 
if I'm going to die, I'm going to die fast. I don't want you to choose. And I don't want to die in a hospital. He got all of that the morning. He passed away. And you know what? The day he passed away, as sad as it was, it was also, um, a, I was incredibly grateful because every person that ever treated him in the dialysis unit at the hospital we were at came through the emergency room to pay their condolences to, to me once they knew it was him that had passed away in emergency. So that to me speaks to who he was. Absolutely. You know, Definitely. I'm incredibly grateful. I, I have so many things, so many stories to tell because, you know, you talk about moments in care. We have so many and it triggers depending on the group you're talking to or somebody's talking to you about their experience, you know, I'm yeah. just incredibly, incredibly grateful and humbled to be part of something like this, to make people aware, you know what, we were on the deceased donor list. And then here in Manitoba for a deceased donor, the typical wait is anywhere between four and eight years. Mm -hmm. Our, he was at the four year mark when he passed away. Prior, prior to his passing, we said, oh, you know what, we're halfway through the waiting period. We only got a little bit longer to go and then you'll get your kidney. So it was yeah. now to talk about it and make people more aware, like people don't realize like that one small gift that they can give changes lives. Absolutely. So I'm well, incredibly grateful. Well, thank you so much, Arlene. It's an amazing journey that you and your family have been through. And, and you said that word a few times, but we're really grateful to have you share your journey and and to continue to do this amazing work in the community, keeping Glenn's legacy alive. So thank you so much for sharing tonight and, and being part of this kidney community. We're incredibly grateful to have you with us. It's a very touching story. Thank you very much for sharing. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to ask Colleen Shelton if she can join us now. Colleen is the nurse manager for the multi-organ transplant team at Toronto General. She is a transplant coordinator. Thank you so much for, for joining us today, Colleen. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself and turn on your video. I've done the mute, but every time I hit start video, it says I can't do it because the host has stopped it. Oh, oh. it's very weird. Let me ask you to start your video. Oh, there we go. There we go. Better? Okay. <laughs> yes. Wonderful. I'm glad you're the techie. Okay, that's perfect. <laughs> Welcome, Colleen. Thank you for joining Hi. us today. Thank you so much. And, uh, and Arlene, I am so moved by your story. I just, I, I feel like I should just be quiet and, and give you the floor because that was really touching. And I, and I'm so sorry for your loss. Your husband sounds like an amazing man. And I got to tell you, you sound like a, a, a pretty big firecracker yourself. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think the way you have described your story and your husband's story is so meaningful for people because it really puts a very personal spin on the experience and uh, hopefully makes it real for people to understand. Just as you were saying, there's not necessarily one important organ. Any one of them fails, you have a big problem. You know, they're exactly. all interconnected and... Uh, yeah, I, I and like I, you said, it should be treated. Strength is amazing. It mm -hmm. should be treated. Once you get that diagnosis saying that there's kidney failure, mm -hmm. it should automatically treat it as bad or as serious as getting a cancer diagnosis or you have your heart's failing. It should be something that level of seriousness. You know, it was very relatable because I could, I was hearing her story and I felt the same way because when I was diagnosed, I didn't take it seriously either because I was in my 20s and I was thinking, oh, I have lots of life to live and I was college and what have you living the college life so when she was yeah. speaking it felt like she was literally telling my story because I didn't take it seriously either in the beginning I'm young where am I going to really go at this point so yeah that whole immortality I mean we all have yes. it when we're young and, yes. and it makes me wonder just hearing you sort of acknowledge that as well Janine is there something that as healthcare professionals we need to consider when people get a diagnosis we know they're only listening to a small portion of what we're saying. It's hard to take it all in. Mm -hmm. Is there value at trying to partner up with a, a fellow patient so they can see the real life impact? And so people understand the, the seriousness of it and how they can uh, partner to help make it as smooth as possible earlier in the process until we get to that extremely serious endpoint. 
I definitely think that is very important because I know for a fact, if I was partnered with someone and they shared their story, how they were diagnosed, what have you, I definitely would have taken it more seriously. I mean, I think I took too long to take it seriously, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And I'm fortunate that everything worked out the way that it did. But early on when I was diagnosed, I didn't take it as seriously as I should have. So if I was paired up with someone, guaranteed I'd take it more seriously, especially if it's someone that's in my age age range or someone close to 100 percent, 100, because it's firsthand experience. Mm -hmm. Right. And and I think, too, when you when you listen to Arlene's story, the one thing that among many that stood out was how much fluid they took off her husband that that yes. first treatment and I, I think mm-hmm. I, I think the general public thinks dialysis cleans your blood as sort of how people generally understand it versus they don't understand that yeah it, it, it detoxifies a little bit but the main goal is getting all that excess fluid off and could exactly. and see what that looks like and where they're headed mm-hmm. I think they might engage in some better behavior sooner and we might be able to partner better sooner as well exactly wow tell me me a little bit about yourself I feel like I'm just talking too much and I'm just (laughs) and I'm not Um, even addressing you (laughs) sure Uh, so again my name is Colleen Shelton I work at the uh, multi-organ transplant program at Toronto General Hospital in Toronto and I've been there for over 25 years. I initially came as the clinical nurse specialist. And then through the the last several years, I've held various leadership positions. My current role, I developed about 10 years ago, and I lead a group called the Multi-Organ Transplant Coordinators. And we're a group of senior nurses who are that interface between the organ donation agency, whose staff help to source the donors that are in our our hospitals all over Ontario. And they work with the donor families, they work with the donor hospitals, they collect the information and then they call us, present us the information. We help make sure that we've got everything we need and then phone the people on call at our center to advise that we have a donor and these are the potential organs. Let's look at A, is it a suitable potential organ for transplant and B, who is the next recipient on the list? And then once we select a recipient, my team then calls in the patients, organizes all the hospital services and serves as the communication hub between all the hospital services, the retrieval team, the organ donation agency from that point until the transplant's complete. Wow. Wow. It's a lot. It's, it, it people is. Like, oh, you just take, you. there's a donor, <laughs> there's a recipient. Not and at all. I will tell you for every every organ that we transplant there's over 200 points of contact and that's so it's not like one email that goes out to 200 people it's 200 separate pieces of communication whether it's a text phone call email whatever we do these days to make one transplant happen and we're happy to do it but it's like it's getting it's really complicated Mm -hmm. Uh, but that's not that's not what the patient needs to know they just need the call (laughs) and come in and get it wow and and you talk about that that big hub about all of those people who are involved. Can you tell us a little bit about who those people are? So when, when you work with that call that comes in that says we have a remarkable donor family who's decided to donate to their loved one's organs, who are those people that you work with to collaborate to get those organs to the recipients? So the first thing is typically we would, once we get the offer from the organ procurement agency, we then call either the medical or surgical person on call for that particular service. So for kidney, we actually call the nephrologist first and we vet everything. And then we sort of serve as a liaison between us and the donor center to say, these are the additional tests or information we're hoping to get before we can make a a decision. Uh, We have to phone the admitting to let them know you're coming. Well, first and foremost is calling in the patient. And if they're outside sort of the driving area, we also then coordinate any flight to come in. And that may or may not include a support person that comes with them. We call admitting to let them know you're coming in. Sometimes we have to call security to let them know you're coming after hours. Then there is the floor, blood bank, HLA lab, the COVID lab, which is super important these days. The ICU, CBICU, depending on the services, if you come in and you're going to need a dialysis treatment, because our routine is that you must have dialysis within 24 hours of your surgery, um, just to get as much fluid off and normalize your electrolytes as much as possible. So we would phone 
the nephrologist to help coordinate dialysis. We phone the fellows. We phone the administration to let them know that transplant is happening. Um, there's a whole bunch of research that happens. So we probably have a dozen researchers that we let know whether or not there's been research consent. Is there an opportunity that may be available here? And then, and then it's just following all that through. And then depending on some of the conditions of the donor recipient, there can be other consultants that need to be brought in. So whether there's a specific medication issues, some of our kidney recipients, a very small number, and I'm gonna forget the actual disease process, my apologies, but they need a very specific med that's super mm -hmm. expensive and pharmacy has to be brought in and there's a lot of coordination with that. Some of our patients who may be from other provinces, we also notify their home provinces and there's a whole other group of people that we wanna make sure know about that patient. If it's a kidney patient, we wanna make sure their dialysis center knows that there's gonna be a spot tomorrow in case they need somebody who needs an extra treatment. When, when, I, when we started this role 10 years ago, we had a one page checklist of what we had to do to make it all happen. And I will tell you, my team and I actually just met this morning, our checklist is up to 21 pages because there's wow. so <laughs> much complexity. And even in that 10 years, certainly over my tenure with the program, we've gone from expanding the age of donors will accept to the age of recipients will accept. We're constantly trying to do more for more people and a lot of that needs more information and more consultation with more experts. But it means, and especially with COVID, everything is so much more complex. It's different. Mm -hmm. It's very different. And, you know, there's things like with COVID, you must have a negative COVID test within 72 hours of your surgery. And, you know, we had one gentleman this weekend we brought in for a, a different kind of transplant, not a kidney. He had come in... Thursday or Friday was negative on COVID and there was an issue with the donor. He could not proceed to transplant. So that transplant was canceled. He was sent home. And then we brought him in on Sunday because it was another donor opportunity for him and we're all good to go. And his COVID test came back positive oh. and he's, and it's so sad. And, but the risk is even if he's not symptomatic, he's caught something. And if I give you immunosuppressants on top of that, you're going to have a bigger problem after transplant yeah. and it may even cost you the organ. So we're wow. always working to make sure it's as safe as possible. Amazing. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and the stories like, like our leans are, we do it for the patients because it means so much, you know, mm -hmm. there's so much that we, we hope to do and it would be, it would be great if we had more access to more donors. So I'm really glad that you showed that be a donor video in the, in the beginning so that people can understand how do they go through the process of considering organ donation, where is the information they need to learn about, and how do they make that process a reality. And they see how easy it is too. It yes, literally it is. It is. And I, I, on one hand, I think the, the Be a Donor website is really easy. I wish there was something where you had to do it so that mm -hmm. it wasn't you had to know about it to do it it's almost too mm -hmm. bad that it remember the old old days it used to be on your driver's license and so when you yes. went to renew you had to do it and these yes. days I'm not sure if there's still that that cue to mm -hmm. to do that you know mm -hmm. during, uh, some other government process mm -hmm. and you, yeah, you, your, sorry oh, yeah. sorry yeah I was <laughs> saying, but we, we have a lot of discussions about the lack of organs and you know how there's so few people who even who register their consent can actually be a donor you know it's it's close to one percent of people who are who are registered who can actually donate and in Canada over nine percent of people accept organ donation but really we're sitting close to that 30 percent mark of registered organ donors and so I'm wondering if with, with your role and everything, if you think if presumed consent, which is now in Nova Scotia, if that came across and all of the provinces in Canada had presumed consent, do you think that would make a big difference in the amount of organs that were available or the wait times in Canada? I think it would make a huge impact. And we know from countries that have the opt-out system or the presumed consent system that their numbers are more than double the organ donation rate in Canada. And I think too, 
I really, you know, years ago, I was fortunate to go for a training um, to under better understand the experience of approaching families for consent for organ donation. And that, that was a really valuable education for me. And in applying that for the donor families that I spoke to in, in the role I had at that time, one of the things that was always struck me was the time that people are grieving for a loved one that's being taken unexpectedly or through tragic circumstances, this is a horrible time to approach them with a big decision and they may or may not know their loved one's wishes. And it, it can be really overwhelming for people and they already have a very challenging roller coaster of emotions. And to add that on top, mm-hmm. is, is, it's a lot to go through and they're exhausted and they're fragile and it's, it's, it's really difficult. And I really do have to salute those donor families that are able to think of somebody else in, in their time of need. And, uh, because it really does take somebody special. And I think if we had an opt-out program, that would just be the normal. There would be no need to go to these people and have them have a a challenging discussion with the family and decide and worry that they're making the decision that their loved one would want. It, It would just be, this is the way it is. And so everybody knows going in, this is the way it is. And it could be one sense of relief. It could also help speed up the process from the point at which that patient may be to pass soon. And when we look at at the actual retrieval and transplant process, because right now what happens is the, if it's a deceased donor and it's somebody who is brain death or neurologically dead, that that point has to be reached clinically. Then the clinical team has to approach the family to say, There's no more we can do, but here is somebody from the organ donation agency to talk to you about next steps. And then that person would come in, they would, you know, speak to that family member about the option. And if that uh, loved one had indicated their interest, either through be a donor or had a discussion with the family, we then start talking about how do we honor that loved one's wishes. If they want to be a donor, let's make it happen. And then we can move forward. But having that discussion, getting the family together, leading people through all the information they need to make an informed decision takes time. Mm -hmm. And the donor's not in stasis. The donor is deteriorating at Mm -hmm. every step. And I think it would add efficiency to the process. I think it would be a a big relief to families. I think it would, and and for people who don't want to donate, the option is still there. You just opt out instead of opting in. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm a big proponent of it. I know it's been a, the bill, to my knowledge, has been presented twice and has not passed. And I'm, I don't really know the politics well enough to know why it hasn't or what those roadblocks mm-hmm. are. But hopefully somebody may come through with a strong proposal to see that through in the future. Mm-hmm. Helene, talk to us about the call. When you make the call, mm-hmm. what is this conversation like? Well, when we call, we have a few rules. One is because we have so many people on the list and we know we only have so much time for that with that donor to have viable organs. Our general rule is that when I start calling the recipient, we have one hour to reach them. There's, we give a little bit of leeway sometimes, but in general, we've got an hour to get a hold of you because the challenge is if I spend a lot of time looking for you, I might miss the opportunity in case mm-hmm. I can't reach you or your, whatever the circumstance is. So we, we have an hour to reach you. So when I call, I say, you know, can I speak to Janine? And Janine gets phone. Hi, Janine. My name is Colleen Shelton. I'm calling from the transplant program. I'm calling because we believe we may have an organ for transplant for you. And then I pause, let them take it And in. at that point, I do backflips. <laughs> yes. <right? laughs> and, and then we just walk people through. Okay, this is what we do. Now, we have a huge screening tool that we go with people because it's not just that you have come up as the next person eligible for this organ. You have to be ready for surgery. You have to be able to get here. No fever, no COVID, no, you know, a whole bunch of stuff that we go through. And for dialysis patients, it's when was your last dialysis? Are you on blood thinners? Anything, any infection? Because any one of those things could actually make it not quite the right time. And, and we certainly caution people, if you have a fever or cough or flu symptoms, 
you need to own up to it because mm-hmm. the first thing that happens is you come to hospital, I'm going to stick a thermometer in your mouth. And if you have a fever, you're going home. Right. right? So we, we lead people through that discussion. And then we talk to them about the timing we need for them to get to the hospital. Mm-hmm. And if there's somebody who's from one of our, our Northern areas, our Northern communities, or somebody who's outside the driving range to our hospital, then we look at trying to organize what that flight's going to look like and how do we organize that with them. Sometimes we have people who are very anxious, mm-hmm. understandably, because ne- you never expect it. We don't expect it. So, um, and sometimes people just need a little bit of time to process that. And mm-hmm. so we, we really try and work with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when we call, hopefully people have, have a plan. So ideally they've got their bag packed. They know what they're doing. They know who's going to take them or they have a plan B. They know who's going to look after the pets, all of that good stuff. What's more challenging is when people maybe hadn't really thought it was going to be really real. And then we call them and they're in a scramble because, wait a second, I don't know about this. And I didn't think Mm -hmm. about that. And I still have to do this. Right. Okay. And sometimes we can help them with some decision-making. Sometimes we can put them in touch with somebody from the psych team to just talk them down and make sure that they're in a space where they, they can go through with this today. And once in a while, there is somebody who's just, overwhelmed to the point that they can't most people most people are delighted and it it really is so rewarding to be the one who gets to call and uh, deliver that amazing news to them then they come to the hospital we get them all IV history ECG chest x-ray everything else that we do lots of blood taking and uh, and then we wait yeah we just we wait for that the donor hospital be able to organize that retrieval surgery And our team goes out and retrieves, comes back and uh, you wake up. And I do know that when the, and you yourselves have probably felt this, when you wake up with your new organ, you know, there's something different about how your body's functioning. 100%. 100%. It's an amazing thing to watch, Mm -hmm. um, especially for the patients who have diabetes as well, because there's a different regulatory system that kicks in and their, their body feels not high or low anymore this is mm-hmm. oh this is a good this is a good feeling you know? i was told and, i was glowing when i oh, came out sweet. of surgery it's lovely. Yes. oh that's so great <laughs> yeah me too i i was told that i had color in my face again and, <laughs> isn't that lovely um, i wasn't itchy you know yeah. it just it's so quick it's amazing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. what happens and talking about that success janine and i are very lucky that we woke up and, and it was a success and we're yes. doing so well. Do you get to know about those people who you've made this life-changing call to? Do you know if their transplant is a success? Are you able to find that out? We know in the, in the immediate operative period, because my team's the one that actually has to do the documentation that yes, the transplant was completed and yes, it got done. And then if there's any follow-up, sometimes we get involved if there's any questions about some of the donor characteristics. So we do know that it happened, it went through, and they're they're doing well in our step-down unit or ICU or CBIC, depending on the organ. So that that's really great to hear. And uh, when I was managing the floor, it was it was it was really lovely to see people taking their first steps after transplant. And um, you know for the lung patients not having oxygen anymore or the heart patients not being bedridden anymore. It was it really lovely. Wow. Mm. What is so, it? Yeah, exactly, right? Mm. So Colleen, since you've seen firsthand the benefits of how, what a transplant can do, how do you talk to your loved ones or family and friends about being a donor? How do, how do you approach that, that conversation? I think it's, I think every family is different and people have different belief systems or misunderstandings maybe about what organ donation is all about. And I think it really just starts with somebody being bold enough to even bring up at the dinner table, hey, I saw this video about be a donor and I hadn't thought about it before, but I'm kind of thinking this is what I would like done. And then y'all can have a conversation about that's, I wouldn't do that or I would, or that's a great decision. Let's all learn more. And this is how it happens. So I think that's probably the best thing is to start with something fairly mm, less controversial than showing up with, this is what I'm going to do and you have to support me. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's a better way to introduce it as, I heard about this thing. This is what I'm thinking. What about the rest of you? Because it's not just about you. It's about any of you could 
potentially be an organ donor. And it's important that the family knows because mm -hmm. at this point, I will say, if you've signed up on be a donor, again, the conversation with your family is pretty easy. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, this person wanted to donate, let's honor their wishes in this way. And we can, we'll lead you through it. And then we're, we all know we've done the right thing according to this person. But for patients who have not had that conversation, it's very challenging yes. because there's different belief systems, there's different mm, levels of comfort with what happens after people pass mm -hmm. and people don't want to make the wrong decision. And sometimes in making, not wanting to make the wrong decision, the default is to no, mm -hmm. and, and that's really challenging. So it's important that the family's included and other people know about your values and specifically your wishes in that circumstance. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with us tonight, Colleen. It's, it's remarkable what you do and incredible that you get to make that call to change somebody's it life. Is. It is. And, uh, and, and again, thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this today. I'm just learning so much listening to all of you and stories like Arlene's and her husband are so important for all of us to understand more about. Absolutely. Definitely. And we'll keep, uh, we'll ask you to stick around because I'm I will. sure have a lot of questions for you. So thank you so much, Colleen. Thank, thank you, Colleen. And now I'll ask if Daryl can turn on his video and unmute himself. Welcome, Daryl. That Hi, is Daryl. Good to see you. Daryl Wallace is a pharmacist and a multi-organ transplant recipient. I'm actually not going to talk too much about that because Daryl's going to tell us about his journey with his life-changing transplant operation of four organs. And uh, last year, his son also enter underwent the same procedure. He is now using his incredible voice to call on more Ontarians to consider registering to become an organ donor. And uh, he is also a guest on our upcoming season four Living Transplant podcast. So thank you so much for joining us tonight, Daryl, and, and talking to us about this. Yes. Yeah, thank, thank you for so yeah, like Candace said, I, uh, I had a, a multi-organ transplant coming up on 16 years this year. Actually, it'll be 17 years this year, just past 16 years. So I had a new liver, bowel, stomach, and pancreas. That was in November of 2006. When I was born, I had a condition called gastrointestinal pseudo-obstruction and hollow visceral myopathy, which basically meant that my stomach didn't absorb nutrients and my stomach and bowel didn't move any of those nutrients through. Started presenting around one year old, wasn't gaining weight, vomiting a lot, lots of diarrhea, just really not doing well. And the, the doctors, I'm from Sarnia, a fairly small town in southwestern Ontario. The doctors here didn't really know exactly what was going on. So they sent my parents and me to London to see if any of the doctors there could figure out what was going on. Still no real answers. They sent us to Toronto, to Sick Kids Hospital there. And the consensus was basically, we don't really know what's going on. We don't know of any way to cure this or solve this. The only real option at that time was TPN or total parenteral nutrition. So essentially IV feeds to give me all of my nutrition to bypass the entire GI system. And the plan at that time was just keep Daryl on IV feeds for as long as necessary until the transplant surgeries, which were a very new idea at the time, were a potential option because this was, I'm 37 now, so 36 years ago, there really weren't any transplants being done uh, and any patients who had the type of transplant that I needed ultimately just ended up passing away because the technology wasn't there. So like I, said, I was on TPN for, for 20 years from the age of about one to just after my, just before my 21st birthday. Um, and I got a call for the organs. It was, it was time for sure. I was in my first year of university at U of T and I was starting to become very lethargic, very tired, 
um, struggling with mental clarity. I was extremely jaundiced, so yellow all over, itchy, fatigued, all of that. Very much at the end stages of liver failure induced by the TPN that was on the one hand keeping me alive, but on the other hand, destroying my liver. So transplant was really the only option. And even at that time, you know, it's 2006. So we think it's you know, technology is pretty advanced. We're pretty good at keeping people alive. Transplant surgeries even then were a fairly risky procedure for, for the type of transplant that I needed. There was a brief time where they had considered maybe just an isolated liver donation, because of course you can do a living liver donation. So there's a, a greater pool of, of donors that way. And my family were more than willing to go through the testing and, and donate portions of their liver. But ultimately that would not have been a, a curative option. And it was really just a temporary stopgap. So the decision was made to, to list me for everything I needed at once in a kind of a cluster transplant, a multi-organ transplant. And I was on the list for just about a year and a half prior to getting my transplant. So all things considered a relatively short wait, but when I got the call, it was certainly, it wasn't a difficult decision to, to go ahead and say yes, because I knew based on how I was feeling that, you know, I, di I didn't have much longer without the transplant. I wasn't going to make it another six months, another year. Like it was, it was essentially now or never, but it's, it's still scary, right? I mean, I was 20 years old in what should have been, you know, my, my college years, my fun, my fun time. This is where I'm supposed to be enjoying life. And, uh, you know, to, to face that kind of surgery with an uncertain outcome was difficult, but ultimately, you know, essentially now or never, right? So I trusted the team I had had. <laughs> Lots of experience in the hospitals at Sick Kids and Toronto General, and surgery was nothing new for me. Being in the hospital was nothing new for me, and everything had always worked out before then. Uh, so I was, I was confident going into the surgery that ultimately it was the best decision for me, and it it was something that I, I felt good about going through with, and I felt like I've done this before. I've lived the hospital life. I've been in and out. I, I know what it's like. I can handle this. It's just one more thing to get through and kind of get towards a more a more normal life, so to speak. Growing up on TPN and the IV feeds was difficult because I couldn't swim really. I couldn't play any contact sports. There was a high risk of infection. So school was always different. I didn't eat solid food essentially for 20 years. And that was to me, that was always the, the biggest thing that I was looking forward to post-transplant was being able to eat. Because food is such a, a cultural thing for us. It's, you know, you get the whole family together and going out and, and spending time with friends and all of that, a lot of that revolves around food. And my parents were always very good about making sure that when the family was eating dinner, even if I wasn't physically eating, I was always there. So that was, it was nice. Um, post-transplant to actually then be in Toronto and be able to experience all of those new cuisines and, and textures and tastes and very exciting post-transplant. And so now it's been 16 years. And the amazing thing about where I am now is just trying to compare it to where I was before the transplant. The, the types of things that I get to do now on a daily basis are things where I never imagined I'd be able to. Something as simple as going out, trying a new restaurant, or my wife and I just went to Nashville for a weekend. And before my transplant, any kind of trip outside of our bubble, so even Sarnia to Toronto, would involve days of planning, weeks of planning, because you need it medical supplies, backup supplies, refrigeration, emergency kits, emergency contacts. Like there was no 
simple. Everything had to be planned, backup of everything. And, and so the amount of freedom, just being able to leave the house without a medical bag, leave the house without the backup medical supplies, like all of that, that we, I now almost some days don't even think about. It's amazing how liberating it is just to not have all of that mental bandwidth occupied with medical things and, and medicine. And certainly I still have follow-up appointments and I still have my medications that I need to take and blood work routinely, but it's night and day difference to, to what it was before transplant. And the other thing that I think when people are considering organ donation might not consider is certainly there's the impact on the individual recipient. So that's me like, yes, I have an amazing life now. And of course there are challenges and there are ups and downs just like everybody's life. But I now have a chance to impact other people's lives. Um, like you said, I'm a pharmacist and I work primarily in substance use pharmacy. So methadone dispensing, suboxone dispensing, a lot of work with a mental health. And so on a daily basis, it's, it's not just me who's affected by this transplant. It's all of the patients that I now get to help. I've been a pharmacist for 13 years. And so over those years, the number of vaccinations that I've given, the number of infections that I've treated, the number of parents that I've counseled on their sick children's medications and helped them work through. It's just the, the single decision to donate organs or donate an organ or being a living donor for a kidney or a liver transplant. That single decision radiates outwards and impacts hundreds and thousands of other lives. And it's just, um, you know, it, it's not an easy decision to be an organ donor. Like Colleen was saying, there's a lot, there's a lot there and certainly approaching a donor family at their, their moment of greatest grief. It's not an easy conversation. It's not an easy decision to be made, but I think having the ability for Arlene and I to share our stories and having a venue to share those stories really helps to demonstrate the incredible impact that those decisions can have on individuals and their families and really their communities. And it's, it's an honor to be able to share my story in, in venues such as this. So I, I'm just grateful to be here. And we're extremely grateful that you are here sharing this story because it, it should be told. And I'm glad you did that. Just to touch back on what you mentioned before about food and family and how important it is. So I'd like to know, what was your first meal? You're finally <laughs> able to eat nice, solid food. What was your first meal? So, I mean, the boring answer is, of course, post-transplant with a new stomach and a new bowel. You gradually introduce food in that setting. So it was, you know, ensure and boost and those mm -hmm. you know boring foods but still yes. exciting for me right because you know the only food that I could really eat growing up were jello and pudding and, and ice cream so things that don't have any texture so for me now my favorite things are things that are crunchy and salty and chewy so something like peanut butter on toast is just mm -hmm. heaven <laughs> <laughs> but immediately post-transplant, it was the simple thing. So and like I said, in Toronto, sushi and the pizza in Toronto, like those types of things, which were things I could never eat growing up. I, I can remember vividly in the hospital. I don't know how old I would have been, six or seven years old. My mom asked me, you know, if you could have anything, just anything in life, what would it be? And, my answer always was just, I just want to eat, you know, mm. like I didn't, I didn't want to get out of the hospital. I didn't want to right. be the line. I didn't want, you know, fancy this or that. I, I just mm -hmm. wanted to be able to eat. Um, and it's like, there are 
there's no words to really express the amount of gratitude that, that I have. And everything, everything I've been able to do in my life since my transplant has been because of that donor family. And my son, oh, and he had his transplant last year. And it's, it's hard because he's had ups and downs post-transplant as well. And, and it's different when it's your own family and your own children who are going through uh, the procedures and, and the testing and the, the recovery from a transplant. For me, I, I kind of knew, oh yeah, I can do this. I've been in the hospital, I, I can handle this. But when it's, you know, when it's your son who's the one who's in pain and, and recovering and having trouble, it's, it's a whole different ball game. And it's, mm -hmm. it's difficult. We need, yeah, it's difficult. We need more um, donors, of course. And it's, I'm hopeful that with the speed at which medical advances are coming and the, the technological advances that we've seen that there will be better options than just only deceased organ donation and only limited live donation options. It, but for the time being, it, it's, there's such a great need for yes. organ. It's not an easy decision for mm -hmm. anyone to make and just yeah for for us and our family certainly we've been touched just in an amazing way and for my family and my local community we're, we're so course. grateful for, for just I'm, I'm so grateful to just to be here and to be able to have these kinds of conversations and yeah it's it's amazing it's just amazing well, we are grateful you're here as well. Extremely mm -hmm. grateful that you're here as well and that you shared your story with us. And hopefully it does reach out to our viewers and this video will be shared and they will, someone will see this and decide, you know what, I want to become a donor. I want to help someone. I want to avoid someone going through the exact same pain that I saw, you know, Janine went through or Daryl went, went through when they shared their story, even Candace. So, you know what, it, this will make a difference. Definitely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Daryl. We're, we're, we're saying this word a lot tonight, but you know, we're so grateful for that donor family that decided to give that incredible gift of life and, and that you're here today sharing your story and getting to do those incredible things like eating crunchy foods and traveling the world. So thank you for sharing tonight. And um, uh, I'm wondering if we can have Arlene and Colleen, join us again, because what we're going to do now is uh, with our last about 15 minutes, we're going to open it up to questions. So wondering if anybody has any questions for our guests, um, please feel free to, to put them in the chat and uh, we can we can answer them. And Colleen, this one is actually for you that we had sent in earlier and I'm not sure if you if you have an answer for this but one question that we had was if somebody decides to become an organ donor can they have a an open casket if they if their loved ones are able to donate organs oh absolutely it, it does not preclude an open open casket at all so when the organs are retrieved there's generally a, a midline incision and that's easily covered by an outfit. It, it, it doesn't go really above the collarbone or below the pelvis. So uh, it's not something that would be visible to anybody at a service. And so we often coordinate with funeral homes and to help make sure that everything works in time. So that family, if they do want an open casket or they have circumstances where funerals need to take place in a certain period of time after death, that we can help make that happen. And TGLN also works to make sure that, that that's honored for the family. Amazing. Thank you, Colleen. 
And Daryl, we have a question in the chat for you. How long did it take for your body to recover from the transplants? Yeah, so I can speak for myself and for my son, Owen. So my son, Owen, when he had his transplant was five. He turned six in the hospital while recovering. He was up and walking around the hospital within two weeks post-transplant. So just amazing. I, um, being much older and obviously much wiser, decided to take it, take it easy post-surgery. So I was probably three, four weeks before I was up and moving, but I was discharged from the hospital two months post-transplant. So I was home within two months. Um, I had some fluid, fluid accumulation around my lungs. So I was back into the hospital for a few weeks to have that dealt with. But yeah, within, so I had my surgery in November. I was midway through my first year of pharmacy school. By the following September, so less than a year post-transplant, I was back at U of T in my pharmacy classes. So it was not necessarily an easy recovery, but nothing unexpected um, from my end. And now, like, I'm perfectly healthy. My wife and I, like I said, just went to Nashville this past weekend. She is extremely fit and into CrossFit. So we went to a CrossFit seminar in Nashville. And so I was able to do most of the workouts while we were there, which, you know, I never would have imagined being able to do that in, in my previous, you know, post or sorry, pre-transplant life, certainly. And even now, like I continue to push myself and, and try to, you know, better myself, mostly to set an example for my, my kids, of course, but yeah, even now, like. 15, 16, 17 years post-transplant, I continue to see growth within myself. And again, all of that is only possible because of that donor family. Amazing. Thank you, Daryl. And I'm wondering, we have a question. If you could move to the side a little bit, what does that say on your wall? So it's a bit hard to see, but it's a clock and there's pictures of our family on it and it's time with family is worth every second. Beautiful. And each um, picture on there is sort of aligned with one of the hours. That's amazing. That's incredible. Wow. And Arlene, I'm, I'm wondering if you can tell us, for people who don't really know what CanSolve or iPERC is, how would they get involved with, with CanSolve and, and what really is it? CanSolve is the, it's the research network for kidney disease. If you want to, we have a website you can go to CanSolve. I think it's cansolve.ca and it tells everything of what we do. There's a, all kinds of different projects. We're always looking for patient partners to join and be part of the network in any capacity they want to join. I mean, some like myself are pretty much in every single part of the network and then others just hone in on what that's important to them. So what IPERC is, is the Indigenous Peoples Engagement Research Council. So it's made up of in indigenous people from our various backgrounds because you know for me the term indigenous it is a term that's how we we all fall under that that umbrella but we are distinctly different communities in that there's first nations metis and inuit i mean the general public might not realize that although we are indigenous we are absolutely different mm -hmm. you know does a does one person know that a First Nations person could be a status Indian where a Métis person is not. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't, don't know the differences between us. Mm -hmm. But so what, what our council does is we're, because Indigenous health is such a concern and with truth and reconciliation and all the things that have happened in our country, this is why the network felt it was important that we come together and form our own committee so we actually are in every part of the research components of the network. So when I first joined, something like a land acknowledgement was never done. Now, every single meeting that council ever has or ever does is started by a land acknowledgement. We have knowledge keepers on every committee. They are there for cultural safety, for teachings, and just to get the, the, the Indigenous perspective within the entire network so we're very 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 involved we have 
something called Wabushke Bijibusganj, which is a learning pathway that we, in the beginning, were asking people to do. Now mm -hmm. we're telling them that you need to take cultural awareness training mm -hmm. and we provide the training. So, I mean, it's, it's grown exponentially for me. I always say that things like IPERC and the learning pathway are the crown jewel of can't solve, you know, and I'm very, very humble to be a co-chair. I've been, like I said, I started very humbly, very quiet, very shy. And I've sort of worked my way into like, they laugh and say, well, I can't imagine you being quiet in any meeting, but that's how I started. And it's given me the confidence, like for myself, I was never really culturally aware of that. Like I always knew I was Métis and I never felt any different than anybody else in the room. And I still don't, but I'm much more aware of the differences. So the need in our community is because we are the biggest community in Canada who suffers from kidney disease overall. I mean, here in Manitoba, the numbers of Indigenous people who suffer from kidney disease are incredibly high compared to anywhere else in, the, in Canada. So IPERC is definitely making strides in that area. So, and we have all kinds of different things. We have like kidney link, you can go on to there and join that. They, there's a kidney screening program based on an app that was developed here in Winnipeg by one of the, the doctors here. So, I mean, there's all kinds of different things to get involved in. I mean, like I said, there isn't a community that I'm not a part of <laughs> or attend <laughs> in some capacity, so. So there's another question here. Will this webinar be uploaded onto the Trillium website? So it won't be on the Trillium website, but it will be on our Center for Living Organ Donation YouTube channel. And we will make sure, so anyone who has registered for this, we will send them the link to the webinar once it's up again on our YouTube channel. And then we were also on Facebook Live tonight, so if anyone wants to have this recording, they can leave a comment and we can absolutely send it the link to people as well. So we will make sure that anyone who would like access to this, they can, they can absolutely have that. Mm -hmm. And then I actually have one last question here for, for you, Colleen. So when you make the call, is it one person who gets that call or is it, or do you call multiple people in case the first person isn't available? So our normal routine is we ask our patients to give us the best number to reach them at. And then any other family and friends or other numbers that might be needed. So if you have five or six people or numbers, we will start with what you identify as the first number and we'll keep calling all of those over and over for one hour. And it'll be voicemails. So it can be family, friends, neighbors, whoever might be able to get a hold of you in an instant. And sometimes it's a workplace or for the kidney patients, we also have their dialysis center. And if we can't get a hold of you, we figure, oh, I wonder if they're in dialysis and we'll mm -hmm. go to dialysis center to try and track you down. Amazing. Wow. Interesting. I think we might have one more question. Mm -hmm. Um, the time a comment was made that there is um, a need for clean water to do dialysis at home and sometimes access and equity to clean water is not always the same across Canada and I'm wondering what what is CanSolve doing to get into these communities and making sure or starting that conversation to see how we can support every Canadian to have access to clean water and dialysis and whatever treatments that they need. Well, they are working towards that. I mean, here in Manitoba, unfortunately, people are having to be flown out of their communities and either come south or go to communities that are closer to them to go do dialysis. So it is a big thing and they are working on it. I mean, we'll never truly get there until things at the government level change. And I mean, the there's lots of changes that have been going on. They con are continuously advocating for that clean water, clean water, you know, and things have changed a lot with the machines too, so that there is, people are able to do hemo at home with a lot of extra help. And the machines themselves have changed. I mean, I know when we were first introduced to it, the water system that was needed was crazy. Mm -hmm. And then what he ended up on was completely different. Right. I mean, it was the difference between using 150 liters of treatment 
to using less than two. <laughs> oh, so they're, they're definitely making lots of change. And then the community is definitely working towards that. So it won't change anytime soon, unfortunately. Right. Mm -hmm. And we only have one minute left. And I know this isn't a lot of time, but Colleen, we've talked a lot about dialysis tonight. And, and I'm wondering if you can leave us with you know, the difference that you know of dial between dialysis and transplant. And what is that? We've heard the impact of transplant tonight, especially from Daryl as well. From your perspective as a nurse, how do you see that? I think, I think there's a misconception that if people don't have dialysis, or sorry, if they don't have a transplant, they have dialysis to fall back on. And from my experience, seeing the patients on dialysis, dialysis is a really hard option. It's, it, it really, it's exhausting. It takes so much of your life and the quality of your own life, as well as those of your family members and transplant can certainly offer you a better quality of life and more opportunities to be independent from the transplant center and the ties to machinery appointments. I mean, Arlene can probably express what those are better than I am, but I, would really encourage patients who are on dialysis to earnestly consider transplant and again, perhaps connect with people who were on dialysis and have had a transplant, but what that difference has made for them. Because having seen both those patients, there's only one choice. I would be on that, I would be on that transplant list the day after I was told I needed dialysis. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Janine, for co-hosting this with me tonight. And I'll, I'll leave you with our final word. Definitely. So once again, thank you everyone for joining us and sharing your stories. It, some of them are very, all of them are very touching. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but I came off camera a couple of times because it was a lot. So thank you for sharing. And, and hopefully all of this will make a difference in the viewers that are watching today. And they will share the story and a difference will continue to be made within the community. So as we've seen tonight, organ donation touches not only just the recipient in giving us a second chance at life, but also family. We've realized that the community is also touched by this as well. We ask that tonight you take the time to learn more about organ donation. If you have any questions about donation process, you can visit the Trillium Gift of Life Network or beadonor.ca. Remember, even if you are a registered donor, your, your family has the last say in the matter. So make sure that you have your say out there for your family and friends to know this is your wishes and this is how you choose to have your life represented. Thank you so much, everyone. Happy National Organ and Tissue Donation Awareness Week and thank you all for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Take care. <laughs>